Uh, so, thank you. Um, so, I will continue uh, the session today explaining an experience that uh, we have been developing for the past two years, uh, part-time. Uh, so, the idea here is that we are, all of us uh, in the project are, are researchers and then we thought that we could use a game to explain what we do to, let's say, uh, the uh, major audience. So, not only uh, scholars, but also people interested in archaeology. So, um, I want to start with a general uh, co context or question, and it's uh, the, the thing of what's archaeology. So, yeah, okay, I, I will not go into detail, but if you think about the method, which is uh, the thing I'm interested in, um, archaeology is uh, for an archaeologist, for someone that knows the field, it's obviously field work, and um, there's a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, work on there, on, on collecting the material we use to uh, explore past societies. But it's not only field work, it's also, for example, geophysics, where we use powerful technology to understand better what's going on in, uh, in the archaeological record. But it's also, for example, uh, using a microscope to uh, identify the plants that people consumed like 2,000 years ago. And uh, you also have stuff like, I don't know, uh, GIS, where uh, you take uh, information for, for uh, uh, different sites and you try to understand spatial temporal patterns, trying to see with a statistic, with a analysis, you try to see the relations between the sites, visibility. So it, we apply in archaeology uh, an amazing amount of different technologies. We use a lot of knowledge from different fields. Um, we know that it's a very, let's say, interdisciplinary uh, discipline. However, if you Google this, what you get is field work. So I think that there's a quite a major difference between what an archaeologist knows about what is archaeology and what the public perceives that archaeology is, mainly because the most visible thing that we do is field work. Okay? Uh, if you think about that, about research in archaeology, uh, the percentage of time that archaeologists uh, are on field work is not really the vast amount of time. Usually you are in a desk, in a laptop, or you are in a, in a lab and you spend most of your time then or uh, writing proposals, papers, applications, whatever. So the thing that here is that there's a major challenge in the sense that how can we increase uh, the visibility of what we could call archaeological science? I, I don't really like the term, but uh, it's not science because it's more or less objective. It's science because we're applying the scientific method. And it's definitely a thing that people do not link to archaeology. And this is one challenge that we want to, let's say, contribute to solve. Um, if you think about this, the, the problem is that it, it's, not about, um, it's not about the field, it's about the reach of the field. If you go to, a, uh, to an archaeology museum, you usually find something like the, the photo in the left, where you have uh, objects and then some text telling you Bronze Age was that. Uh, this is not exactly what the field is. Uh, if you think about the science museum, science museums are not about, obviously they explain things, but it's more about questions. It's more about questioning you, uh, who you are, how can we know what we know, uh, what's, uh, uh, what's uh, let's say, our environment, how do we work, these kind of things. And, um, well, it's not that different in the end because uh, you don't, so when you do research in archaeology, it's not like you say, bronze age was that. You are more like, okay, with the evidence I have, the idea I got, and the techniques I use, I think that this is what happened, but probably this is all the things that would also have happened. And if someone comes with more ideas or more evidence, maybe I will change my mind. So it's way closer to the right one than to the left one. So, um, in the end, I think that the challenge we face when we try to explain archaeology is that we, we are only explaining the objects and the field work, and we should also explain what are our research questions, what are what we want to know. What we want to know. Also, the method we, we have, the, the bunch of different methods we use, and the tools we are actually using in order to uh, answer this or try to answer uh, say, these research questions. And uh, this is the, the context that we face when we try to explain, uh, to do some uh, of rich activities for this project, Simulpass. So, uh, Simulpass is a project about simulation in archaeology. The idea is to you uh, have a room, you put some archaeologists there, you put also people doing simulation there, uh, you tell them, look, you won't go out until you work together, you close the door and you finish. So this is more or less the idea for five years. Um, and the, uh, it was applied to a different case study where uh, simulation was not applied before. And uh, the 
topics that we were exploring were things like uh, the emergence of cooperation, uh, the emergence of identity, and neolithic dispersion, so uh, very different topics that could be explored using simulation. The problem is that when we go to what uh, the project is about, or the resolution of the project is about something like this, and this is definitely not what people think archaeology is. So you have algorithms, you have, I don't know, statistics about stochastic processes with... So, yeah, okay, if you go, I mean, trust me, if you go to someone and says, yeah, this is archaeology, well, it's difficult to explain. Uh, it's difficult because it's one not people is seeing uh, that archaeology is about. So, the aim of this uh, initiative is, one of them was obviously to explain simul pass what we do, and also the methods we use but also to break this barrier that I think is completely false in reality about science and humanities. Uh, maybe it was, uh, this barrier uh, was active, let's say, a hundred years ago, but right now, if you think about what we are doing here, it doesn't make any sense at all to talk about science and humanities anymore, especially if you talk about archaeology. And finally, the, the last aim that we have is that I, think, I feel that sometimes people seeing that archaeology is about digging to get objects. And no, it's about, I mean, we all know that it's about research questions. So the idea is that we wanted to explain why do we dig, because we want to understand cooperation, we want to understand the, the gender uh, studies we apply to archaeology, or stuff like that. So the idea is, can we explain this in some other way than the usual ones, because the usual ones clearly uh, are not working here. And so uh, I'm happy to say that uh, we were not the only ones because uh, yesterday we had some similar presentations about using a video game to explain uh, this, this type of computer simulation in archaeology. Why? Because it's, it's a simulation. A game is a simulation, so it's not that different from what we do on a daily basis. Also because it's interactive. So we break this idea of Bronze Age was that because you have a, like, like a tree of uh, different options that you can explore usually. And also because it's non-linear. So all these ideas that uh, this linearity and this, uh, if you want, static vision of the past should be broken or can be broken using a video game. So this is the result. Uh, the idea is that, well, uh, we, we wrote a proposal about that and we got a private uh, foundation uh, putting some small budget for this. So uh, we were quite happy uh, with this. And uh, the result is a video game that has been released like a month ago called Evolving Planet, uh, where you mainly take the role of a, a researcher that arrives to a planet where a species has been uh, has been has become extinct, a uh, species similar to the humans, and then what you do is that you need to uh, explore what happened to them and try to understand why they became extinct. Uh, the idea is that you use this setting in order to uh, more or less connect uh, this uh, science fiction context to uh, what archaeology is uh, right now. So the game is for iOS and Android, and, and I mean, you can freely download it uh, right now if you want, and it's not great. Um, so I want to explain a lot of the game. I think it's better if you try it. Uh, I what I will explain, I think, could be interesting for you is the design decisions we do during the process. Okay? So these are five things that I want to talk about. This is the platform. Um, so we had a very small budget, uh, but we wanted to arrive to the most uh, uh, possible audience. Uh, it, it's, it's difficult. So what we decided is to develop it in a, in a platform that allows us to uh, generate the code and port it to a different uh, system. So in this case, we decided to do a tablet-based game or a portable device game and do it for iOS and Android. So in this sense, uh, everybody with a smartphone or a tablet can play. Uh, there were other options like doing it for Steam or, or consoles, but they were considering the team, I don't think that this is feasible because what you would have is like you need, so the, the effort of uh, maintaining a different version is, is high. If you have three or four different versions, it's higher and higher to the point where you are just uh, trying to see what's going on on different systems. Um, about the game mechanics uh, or gameplay, um, this is a strategy game. Uh, it's a short strategy game. The idea is that you can sit and, and play it for, for uh, a couple of hours and finish it, or if you want, 10 minutes every day for a week. So, so the idea is that you have these missions where in each mission you explore a different topic uh, of the past of these species, the Rodans, in a way similar to what you would do in uh, exploring the prehistory of, of uh, humans. 
Uh, the topics that you that you use to uh, finish the goal, the game. I mean, the goals of the of the game are things like uh, common dispersion, the of adaptation, uh, conflict and cooperation, or the dispersion, or let's say the dynamics between hunter gatherers and uh, farmers. Uh, we tried here to put all the recent research on on this. Uh, we tried, but obviously it will be, it means that in a couple of years this will be already uh, outdated, but still. So how does it work? More or less, uh, it's like I mean, it's quite similar to an Asian-based model. You have a map with a bunch of uh, agents that are the uh, white dots, and you have some goals and some attributes that you can modify. So uh, you uh, modify not the agents but the population as a whole, leading them to some point that uh, usually is a, is a goal, but also modifying the different attributes they have. So you can, for example, in a, in, a, in a particular scenario, you can say, okay, I think that here what I need to increase is the reproduction rate of the, of the agents or the trade mechanism because it's the only way to get these resources, etc., etc. So see, this is how it goes. And every mission has different attributes and different objectives and different uh, About the plot, um, okay, we, we decided, uh, let's say, after some months to go for a science fiction context and Let's say that it was interesting that the faces of the, of the simul past and the uh, people from the foundation when we told them, yeah, we want to explain archaeology with, uh, from the 50th century. So it was quite interesting. To me, the reason is this. Science fiction is the most important thing in the history of the world. They probably say that. So. Because it's a history of ideas. So it's a literature of ideas, of trying to explain things of the past and the present using the future. Because you have this context where you can do whatever you want. And this is exactly what we needed. Uh, first of all, we could create a new narrative, a different narrative that has a lot of points in contact with our history, but let's say skipping the things that we were not interested in and focusing on the things that we were. Second, because we wanted to highlight this research question. So the way to do it, if you do, uh, so if you do the same for Planet Earth, the problem is that people already have a background of what, I don't know, what some younger are, dynamics with Sabian and so on. If we have a different planet, well, you don't know anything at all. So the thing is that research questions are more important and then you can advance the plot of the game using these research questions. I don't know what happened here, so let's try to do this. Let's try to do the other thing. And it's way closer to what we are close to every day. Finally, um, the thing is that we wanted to do something interesting with the artwork, considering that one of the obvious weaknesses of the game is that an easy based model is, uh, is not fancy in the center of the, the user interface. So we wanted to do something in contrast with that. Also because it's quite cold, in the sense that what you have here is a map with a bunch of blue of white dots. So we wanted to give some life to the game and to this planet that we were studying using, using the other one. So we did something like this, where um, it, it goes this way. Every, every mission, uh, what you do is that when you pass a mission, there is a, a one illustration that is unlocked, so you can, you can actually see it, and then there's some sentence linking the artwork to the mission. Okay? The idea here is to establish two different narratives. One is the mission itself, so the research goals, if you want. The other one is uh, relate the player to the population that you are guiding. So what you are doing here is doing some kind of agent, uh, creating some kind, some kind of agency to the agents in the sense that we are giving them uh, some way to uh, explain themselves through this sentence, and then you can see them, and you can see how they change over time, etc., etc. So uh, we put a special care on all the on all the illustrations. We work a lot on them, and well, you have to think that when the first mission that technology is introduced, you have this kind of illustration or something like religion, where uh, we can also relate that to the to the player in the sense that the religion of this uh, species, this new species, is linked to the ship where you are, and you are controlling them because it's the same law of the mission, let's say. So in some way you're establishing a lot of contact between the both, uh, both layers of the game. Now, for example, the Neolithic transition here, uh, we, we had a, an issue here because we didn't want to call it Neolithic transition. So it's like, okay, how can we use a word that it's not, it's more neutral? And in the end we came up with the idea of using the word of terraforming, that in the end it's Neolithic transition but in a science fiction context, so we, I think it worked more or less well. Um, so yeah, this is uh, the type of things we did with illustration and uh, the idea is that it's not only some fancy artwork of the game but also that uh, allows us to put some faces, if you want, to the Asian we are, we are playing with. The, the final point is uh, being a, a sort of an evolutionary archaeologist myself was quite important is the idea of 
this is uh, something that it's a uh, society that is changing, so we want to explain how it changes. And if you think about it, the idea of evolution being biological or cultural is one of the most important ideas in science, but it's at the same time one of the worst understood ideas in science, uh, uh, thinking about the, the main audience. Not only that, uh, I mean, uh, if you talk about cultural evolution, there's a lot of people that think about Spencer and social Darwinism, and it has nothing to do with that, right? So the thing is that uh, in the end, you have something like this, that it's this kind of linear idea of evolution. It's a typical uh, idea that people have of evolution. The other one is the market instead of Darwinism, because uh, people change or adapt over time instead of the whole population. So we wanted to change this idea. Okay? We wanted to use the game in order to uh, explain what evolution is about. However, evolution is boring uh, as from a gameplay perspective. Why? Okay, if you think about that, if the player is modifying anything, it's intelligent design, right? Because if you modify the environment or you modify the population, then you are kind of a god for the system. So in the end. Well, it's very difficult, and I think I have not never find a game about uh, evolutionary dynamics where the game itself is not intelligent design. We uh, spent a lot of time trying to see how can we solve it in the end. The game is more or less intelligent design, but we needed something uh, about how can we win this fight between interaction and Darwin. Uh, one of them is that missions have multiple solutions, so uh, it's not linear. You can, for example, there are scenarios where you have uh, you have a choice: do you want to uh, pass it, uh, amplifying or increasing the conflictivity or the warfare of your population? The other option is going for uh, cooperation and then trying to increase your, the population size by cultural influence. Uh, the second one is that uh, there's trendy right now that all the games have a great levels. Uh, we try to avoid that because it, it is progress in some way and we, want, we didn't want to go there. So the idea is that as evolution in the game, the complexity of the mission will increase over time, but only the complexity in each mission you start from scratch. And for example, after some missions where you have uh, terraforming, so neolithic, you can have one mission that is about hunter, so about dispersion of uh, hunter gatherers. Meaning that this is not linear and this is not direction. You have this kind of oscillation of reversion of this kind of very complex process that research right now is discovering. And finally, I won't spoil the plot, but um, the idea here is that the plot itself can, can be used for that. Because uh, let's say that uh, this idea of intelligence and design in the plot, you can see how it's not as strict and organized as uh, you were thinking when you began the game. So um, the results right now, we are quite happy, and I think that the simul passport is quite happy with this right now. We got over 10,000 downloads in more or less one month. Uh, if you can see, I mean, it's not amazing for a game, but if you think about uh, the small bite of us, so it's a, it's a research or, uh, or read uh, initiative, well, the number of active people involved in scientific outreach is not that high, so 10,000 is a pretty decent number. Also because there's community generating new content and it means that they like the game and they want to extend it. For example, we wanted to create some uh, walkthroughs uh, on YouTube, but people started doing that, so uh, fair enough, we don't need to, to do this. And finally, we got a lot of interest from teachers. Um, so we were not specially focused on doing something for class, but uh, we got involved. So in the project, there were people from from University of Barcelona, which is expert in didactics and teaching and we did some testing uh, before uh, before the beta release with uh, teachers and people studying uh, so undergrad of teaching studies and we introduced that did there in the in the process so uh, we think that it can be used for classroom and actually we have again we're in contact with some teachers that they want to they want to use it so i think here uh, just well we, we got some uh, specializing uh, newspapers in, in games but also in, in mass media were interested in the game because of this research interest in the project. Uh, so thank you uh, very much. Um, I think that it, it can be useful for you guys if you are interested in applying this kind of thing of using a game for explaining archaeology. So I hope that all these experience and thoughts were well interesting for you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk. I'm sure. I just downloaded it. Um, 
I see that it's from uh, HMS Legal Productions. Was that yeah. a company that was specifically set up for the game, or is this a partnership between you and yeah. the developer? Okay, um, we started, uh, so we were like, uh, the core development, we are five people, uh, two programmers, one and myself, and another one, uh, one archaeologist, um, content developer, and uh, two uh, people doing the artwork. We start to say HS and HMS bigger, then we say, yeah, we need a uh, more catchy name, so we use Mafisos game, there is some kind of uh, this kind of complexity thing that we, we like. However, we when we registered the game in the Apple Store, we use HMS Bigger and we couldn't change it. So yeah, it's the name of the studio, but it's it's not really HMS Bigger. So no, we we developed by by the uh, by the staff. We didn't use any other company. Questions? Thank you, uh, Sophie. Very interesting talk. I was interested because in the beginning of your presentation, you said you wanted to more or less explain to the audience or to the public what archaeology is and the methods of archaeology, etc. And now you've created a game which explains the evolution of the planet. But how do you relate this to the practice of archaeology and the inherent met methodology and such? Well, um, I'm involved in, in the field of archaeology, it's called model-based archaeology. So the thing is that we use computer models or computer simulations to understand the past. And this is mainly what you do in the game. Uh, the other thing is that when you, are, when you pass the missions, uh, you get achievements, okay? And if you, if you unlock the achievements, uh, you get additional content explaining the research related to the game. Okay, so for example, you can have some entries about, I don't know, astrophysics, about what's an exoplanet. You have other ones about, uh, I don't know, the study of bones in archaeology or uh, things like quotes from famous scientists. So besides, let's say, the game itself, all the achievements are trying to relate the game to current research. Um, you said you had different outcomes and missions. Yeah. Does that also uh, influence the outcome of the entire game? And does that then cause to play the lead? Um, well, well you, yeah, the outcome is the same for all the missions, but you have different strategies to reach the outcome. However, in the, in the last mission, you have some kind of uh, two endings. So you can decide what you do to the end, uh, what you want to do in the end. And this is part of the evolution thing I was telling you about, that I don't, we didn't want to look like we were selling intelligent design. Yeah, I've been there playing a game over the past few weeks. Very, very cool. So one of the things that always is a bit stress out, stress, uh, stressing for me is uh, the timer. <laughs> Have you ever, uh, in the designing process, thought like, let's make a sandbox mode too, where people can start playing with these different factors and things like that? Or uh, never, never, uh, because you that, that you could uh, make it. It's very tricky because we were surprised about how some people find it super difficult, some other people find it boring because it's too easy, and it, it's really difficult to find the place. We would have created different difficulties, but we didn't have the enough, let's say, budget to do this because we need a lot of testing for each level of difficulty. However, uh, the game was uh, was developed thinking about publishing the, publish the code as open source and, and with an open source uh, license. So uh, we will publish it in the next uh, month or so. And the idea is that if someone wants to take a look at the code and send it, including the XML file with all the configuration of the files, uh, it's completely uh, free to do it. So yeah, if you want. <laughs> a very cool one. Not a, not a coder myself yet, but maybe I'll just pick up specifically for this. Um, so 10,000 downloads a month, that's, that's really great. That's a very good outcome, that's uh, well, uh, amazing especially for archaeologists. Um, any feedback on it? So from the general audience, I mean, of course you get these, yes, you get reviews on, on iTunes and things like that. Any uh, idea of that? Okay, um, we discovered that the reviews in, in Apple, especially in the, in the Android, in the Google Play Store, are kind of, let's say, they are not as... Um, 
direct as you could think because there's a lot of companies involved in trying to, I mean, that you pay them just for increasing the rates of your game. Meaning that if you don't have these companies, then you, you rate increases and, and then you don't have a lot of amazing uh, reviews. Having said, that, having said that, we got uh, quite uh, diverse uh, feedback, like from people that was loving it uh, to people that said, yeah, mm, it's not my type of game. I think it's very difficult to target everyone, to please everyone. And, and it's, uh, let's say, in some ways a contradiction with the fact that we want to reach to as much uh, audience as possible. So I think that you, basically if you like puzzle games, strategy games, you will like it. If you like research or science, you will like it. And obviously if you like a first person shooter, well, it's maybe some of your type of game. <laughs> Uh, hey, well, thank you. Uh, I don't know if you already mentioned it, but how long did the development process take uh, exactly? What, what do you mean? How did it take? How, how, would, would, uh, how did we work? It's the entirety of it, from uh, conceptual ah, okay. concept to. Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, we got the funds and then we started two years ago. We started with. Uh, um, let's say a document of uh, a vision of what we wanted to do. With this vision in mind, uh, from this we created the first draft of the, of the plot and the, let's say the story and what we wanted to do. And from here we started with, uh, with the coding of the system that was in the analysis of this model. So we knew already what we wanted to do. I want to say that none of us worked full time on this. So we were working and then in the weekend some of us uh, was also working on this. We put a lot of, of effort, but I think that the thing that is a small team, just five people make it very easy to work together. We already knew from past experiences, so um, the, here uh, we had like two groups. One was the illustration people and the other one is the people doing the code. Uh, the coders, we work uh, using some extreme programming techniques. I don't know if you know. So, so the idea is that uh, you work together uh, as a pair, not as uh, individuals alone. So you use a lot of GitHub uh, in the sense of all the issues that you can keep of the stories. And so it's a, let's say it's a system to uh, make it very efficient for small things. And also we got a lot of input and feedback from the, from the illustration uh, using the content, uh, the expert in, co in content that causes the bridge between all the people. So yeah, it, I think it was quite simple because we were a small team and yeah, we, we knew how each of us worked together. Perfect. Let's save more questions for the discussion. For the session. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.